I am Pooja, and to those who have just joined us, I extend a warm welcome to you all. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker for the day. Tanvi Srivastava is the translator of the War Diary of Asha San, written by Lieutenant Bharti Asha Sahai Chaudhary of the Rani of Jhasi Regiment. She is the author's granddaughter-in-law. The book has been longlisted for the Atta Galata Bangalore Literature Festival Book Prize 2022. Tanvi also writes fiction and has been published in journals like Asymptote, Kitab, and Gulmoha Quarterly. Tanvi, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul, Patricia, everyone here, Parna, for having me here. Um, it's a real honor to be here among people who love history, to, who love stories, to share this very special story. It's the story of my grandmother-in-law. Um, her name is Asha San, which is what her Japanese friends used to call her when she grew up in Japan. And um, just a bit of her background, she was born in 1928 in Kobe. Um, how she got to Japan, we'll get into it in a bit. Um, her family were members of the Indian National Congress, um, great supporters of Gandhi, of Dr. Rajendra Prasad. Again, it's very intriguing how they got to Japan, and we'll get into that in a bit. Um, she met Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose for the first time in 1943 in Tokyo. And the moment she met him, she said, I want to join the Rani of Jhasi Regiment, take me. He looked at her and he said, you are too young, you are too thin, <laughs> gain some muscles, then come back to me. Um, it took her about two more years to get to the Rani of Jhasi Regiment camp in Bangkok, and that happened in 1945. Um, throughout this period, throughout the war, from 1941 onwards, she kept a diary. And intriguingly, it was all in Japanese. Her mother tongue in those years was Japanese. Within the family, everyone spoke Japanese. Um, and this is the diary that she uh, translated into Hindi in 1973. Um, this was published in Dharmayog magazine, which some of you may have read um, exactly 50 years ago. And uh, it was published in a serialized manner. And later, my father-in-law compiled it and published it as a book, which I luckily happened to find on my bookshelf during the lockdown. Um, and it was just a great accident, actually, that I started translating it. Um, I read an article by Jhumpa Lahiri um, saying that if you want to improve your craft of writing and you speak two languages, try translation. Till then, I had never tried it before, and I found that I just loved it. Um, and so now we have um, the story out here. And um, Dadi Asha San is 95 years old. She lives in Patna, and she is one of the last surviving members of the Rani of Jhasi Regiment and one of the last few members of the INA. Um, we have a small video I will play if I can figure out how to play. <laughs>
back to where Dr. Jalil also started, the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. Um, this war, I cannot stress how important it was for Asia. Um, this was the first time an Asian power defeated an imperial power, in this case, Tsarist Russia. Um, and the effect it had was across Asia, and we saw in India, as Dr. Jalil mentioned. Um, but what allowed Japan to win? Um, and we come back to the history of Japan briefly. Um, so in 1853, um, this is, Japan was already in the Edo period at this time. Um, the US first approached um, Japan to open a few trade ports. And they were not very friendly. They came with their warships and um, there was a US Commodore, US uh, Commodore Matthew Perry. Um, he arrived and he came and he said, I want to trade. Um, and J the Japanese rulers at that time realized that this was a threat of colonialism. It was right at the doorstep. Um, so an, an, a new emperor came about, uh, Emperor Meiji, um, and he decided it was time to modernize Japan. So the Meiji Restoration happened in 1868, and when we talk about modernization, it was following a Western model of um, modernization. So industries were built, um, militarization happened intensely, um, conscription happened for the first time, and this was a big change in Japan, because prior to this, only samurais were permitted to carry weapons, and suddenly every male of age was uh, forced to be conscripted, and hence there was equalization that happened in society as well. Um, another great thing that happened was the, there were free national public schools that opened up, um, so free education for all, and Asha-san actually went to one of these schools, and the duty here was always to the country and to the emperor. Um, and that carries forward and that builds that sort of nationalism that gave rise to the, uh, the empire. Um, and we had the two wars that um, happened, one in 1895 and then the Russo-Japanese War. And for the first time, Asia had hope. There was, there was this idea that Asians can unite and fight imperialism together. Um, and Obviously, the, the Western powers did not like this. Um, and this is um, the AB, ABCD encirclement line. This is something that Asha San studied in school. This is what, in their public schools, they were taught how the, the A for America, B for British, C for China, D for Dutch, how these Western powers have created an embargo across, uh, around Japan. And Japan did not have many resources themselves. 80% um, of their oil, for example, was imported. And suddenly there was embargoes on oil, on iron ore, on steel. They could not grow, they could not grow the military, especially the way they wanted to. And they took this not as a, as a um, sign that they need to de-escalate, but they took this as a sign of war. Um, and soon after is when uh, Japan joined the, first world, uh, the Second World War. Um, another just a short video, because I just love um, pictorially showing you how history was at that time. Um, a short video of how modern Japan was. This is a, a video from 1941. So no sound here, but just look at the vehicles, look at the way people are dressed. Um, and very interesting is somebody had asked me recently, how do you have so many photographs of that time? We have very little documentation. How do you have? So if you can see on the left there, there's a camera shop. Um, Japan was on the forefront of innovation. You had the Fuji, the Nikon, the Canons. Everything was booming at this time. So the big question that everyone asks me is, how did the Sahais eventually end up in Japan? And um, this is a photograph taken again in 1941 um, with their neighbors in Tokyo. Um, it's the Japanese New Year. Um, in the center, you can see uh, Asha's mother, Sati. Next to her on the left is Anand Mohan Sai, and his brother also joined them in 1931, Satyadev Sahai. And there were four siblings all together. Asha is at the back towards the right. So, the story truly, I think, begins with Asha San's mother, Sati San Sahai. Um, she was a very, very strong lady, and you will see that in the, in, the, in the book itself. You could see it in the way she talks to her daughter and how she encourages her to join the Rani of Jhansi Regiment. Um, she comes from a very illustrious family herself. So her mother, Urmila Devi, was Deshpanju uh, Chitranjan Das's sister. And this is during the heights of the non-cooperation movement, the early 1920s. Um, Asha San's mother, Sati, used to be in this environment where um, C.R. Das had just become um, the president of the INC. Um, Netaji had become his personal secretary. So they used to visit their houses. There's a lot of interaction. 
Um, but I really want to focus on the mother and the aunt. So Basanti Devi is uh, Chitanjan Das's wife, and Urmila Devi, Sati's mother. Together they were active Gandhians, they were very active in the non-cooperation movement. They were the first two women arrested in Bengal during the non-cooperation movement. And um, Sati was there protesting in the streets when they were arrested. Um, they were arrested for selling uh, khadi, which was banned at the time. Um, and it really had a deep impact on Sati and then through Sati on Asha San herself. Um, and something just I found in the archives as well, how in the 30s as well, um, Urmila Devi's name came up in the news, saying about Bengali ladies who are violating laws. Uh, and then lots of letters between her and Gandhiji about the Congress, about the non-cooperation movement, about how women need to take part in the freedom struggle. Um, again, to, as, as Dr. Jalil said, Jaliana Malabak uh, had a great, great impact. This is a letter written by, not a letter, sorry, it's a diary entry written by Sati, Asha San's mother. And it's written in 1941, so it's like 20 years plus since it's happened, but the wounds are still so raw. She's written, ye, give us liberty or give us death. Every year we Indians observe this day all over the world where there are Indians with a fresh feeling of remembrance of the most brutal tragedy. So it's, it's I think for us it's a little hard to understand how brutal and how, how the, 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 the effect of this one incident lasted for like 20 years. In 1941, she's still writing about it. Um, and Sati, uh, Shasan's mother, studied at Shanti Niketan during the time Tagore was there. Um, so she studied um, in, in the arts department in the Kala Niketan, and Nandlal Bose was uh, her teacher. Um, so again, very like this environment where nationalistic ideas flowered. Um, this letter is not very clear, but it's from um, when Tagore visited Kobe, Japan in 1929. Um, so there was interaction between them, and this is a letter that was translated by, I think, Dr. Supriya Roy. It's in the Rabindra uh, archives, Rabindra Nantagar archives. Um, and it was quite amusing, actually, because when they visited the house in, in Tokyo, in Kobe, um, the, the roof was quite sh uh, short, so Tagore couldn't actually enter the house. So he said it was nice visiting, I wish I could have entered properly, but... So this is a line uh, which Sati has written, has said in the book, Netaji's soldier will hold a gun in her hand, not a flower. And I just love this line, because, because imagine if you're sending your 17-year-old daughter off anywhere, off to war. I, I find it very hard to imagine, to, to imagine like what emotions she must be going through and to encourage her daughter to actually go off to war. Next we have um, Asha San's father, Anand Mohan Sahai. So he's from Bihar, a small rural town called uh, Purani Sarai, close to Bhagalpur. Um, sort of modest upbringing, not too well off. When he was very young, he had a brush with the Anushila and Samiti, um, which is the secret underground society that Aurobindo Ghosh started. Um, but he was not involved in the movement at all at that point. It's only when he went to Patna, he was studying at Patna Temple Medical School, that he heard a speech by Mahatma Gandhi this is during the non-cooperation movement at the very start of it. And um, he was convinced to leave medical school and to join the non-cooperation movement. And he became the personal secretary of Dr. Rajendra Prasad. And again, the Chauri Chara incident is the one that changed everything for a lot of people. Um, so this is when, in, in the small town of Chauri Chara, um, rioting broke out, several policemen were killed, and Gandhiji called off the non-cooperation movement. So this had a rippling impact all across the country, but especially in the people who, like Anand Monsa, had given up everything to join the non-cooperation movement. Um, he did not know what to do next. Across him, whatever leaders of the Congress were being arrested, um, he knew that he wanted to still fight for India's freedom. He didn't know how. Um, so so in 1922, December, this was uh, when the Gaya session of the Congress was happened. It happened in Bihar, and uh, Dr. Rajendra Prasad was in charge of it, and Anand Mohan Sai was on the ground making the plans happen, making, setting up things. And Bihar was not a very rich uh, state, so it was difficult gathering funds to set up everything. But it was a very instrumental meeting for Anand Mohan Sai because C.R. Das, Chitranjan Das was the president at this time. And his uh, sister, Urmila Devi, was there, and his niece, Sati, was also there, singing Vande Matram on stage. 
Um, so this is the first time Anand Mohan Sahay and Sati met. Um, but also they met Nidaji, because Nidaji was there as Siyadas, his personal secretary. Um, so a very, very important meeting for all three of them. But like I was saying, Anand Mohan Sahay did not want to be arrested. He wanted to contribute. He didn't know how. Um, um, he applied to go to uh, the US to join the Ghadar movement, but his name was already blacklisted. He did not get a passport to go to the US. Um, so someone told him, why don't you try going to Japan? And then from there, you can see, you can try getting onto another ship to the US. So that's how he ended up off to Japan. And in 1927, um, Sati also joined him. They got married. And Asha San was born a year later in 1928. Um, very interesting because Kobe is where they settled and Kobe was majority uh, mercantile community so there wasn't um, any notion of nationalism in terms of the Indian freedom struggle, there was nothing there for Anand Mohan Sai to join, to contribute, yet they still tried as a family in the, in the center photo you can see there's a tricolor behind them, um, they would sing nationalistic songs at home, they would spread the word in their community. Um, and Asha San on the right is standing with two of her teachers. So, so they were taught in Japanese schools, they were taught in Japanese. And very interestingly, even at home they spoke Japanese more than they spoke Bengali or Hindi. So this is um, an example, this is a letter which um, Anand Mohan Sai on the left has written in Japanese. So he uses uh, Katakan, which is the more simplified script. And I asked Asha San herself to translate it, and she said, oh, his Japanese is not very good, but she translated it. Um, so this is when he was touring across Asia, spreading the message of the freedom struggle in India. Um, so it just gives you a hint of what life was. My dearest Asha, yesterday I sent you a postcard from the dock. Did you get it? I'm now on a ship to Shanghai. The ship left at 3 p.m., and it is now 4 p.m. It was very rainy today, so I was soaked with rain when I got onto the ship. The rain has stopped now. I'm sure Asako's school will be closed soon. So she was also called Asako in, uh, in Japan, which is a, a, a female Japanese name. Um, so Anand Mohan Sahai and Sati Sahai, they both um, together started something called the India Lodge in Kobe. And this was a, a small hostel, a small guest house, which they opened up. And any Indian merchants, students, anyone passing through, was allowed to stay here, and through it, they actually managed to build the sense of nationalism in the Indian community there. Um, Anand Mohan Sai was active throughout Japan, throughout Asia. He would go to a you can't really see in the center photograph, but he's standing at the back asking the Japanese youth, do you support the Indian freedom struggle? And he was writing a lot. He was um, going out, giving talks. Um, they also started the Indian National Congress branch in Kobe. So here on, on the right, um, they're hoisting the flag on the Independence Day, January 26th, which was declared by the INC in 1930. Um, and like, an interesting story is um, Sati being the fierce woman that she was. She actually went around Kobe to all the Indians, the houses of all the Indians, to check if they had hoisted the flag. And she found that two places they had not, and they had the Union Jack fluttering. So she took a matchbox and lit the Union Jack. Um, obviously the British Consul did not appreciate that and they complained to the Japanese authorities. But by then the Japanese were, no, Sati is a great patriot, she's fighting for the freedom of a country, we're not going to do anything. Um, together they also started this wonderful magazine which used to come out called Voice of India. Um, and in, in this photograph you can see this is the Golden Jubilee issue of the INC. So they had a big gala dinner on the left. Um, all the news from, that was published in the Congress in, in local newspapers was published here as well. And it was very interesting how they were, did it because they uh, would publish the news in English and in Japanese. And they found that a lot of Japanese youth were reading it because they wanted to learn English. Um, and through that they were also getting to learn about the Indian freedom struggle. And Sati here was the designer in the house. She would designing all these beautiful uh, covers and motifs. Um, so again, Raj Bihari Bose was also in Japan at that time. Um, he was based out of Tokyo and uh, Anand Mohan Sai was out of Kobe. So while they did interact, um, they formed two different, almost competing organizations. So Raj Bihari Bose had started the IIL, Indian Independence League out of Tokyo, 
whereas Anand Monsai was starting the Indian National Association across uh, from Kobe and in other places uh, across Asia. And um, the INC actually in 1936 had said that we cannot have branches of the, of the National Congress Party in, anywhere else. So he had to shut that down and open the Indian National Association. Um, he also worked very closely with uh, Raja Mahindra Pratap, who was the first, who founded the first provisional government of India in exile in Kabul in 1915. Um, so they were all working together. Sorry. Um, on the left side, you can actually see that photograph with Raj Bihari Bose in the centers. Um, they are carrying newspapers. And the newspaper actually says war. You can't see it very clearly there. So that was the day um, when Japan joined the Second World War. Um, so basically, after that, um, Anand Mohan Sai realized that there isn't much he can do from Kobe itself. So the entire family shifted to Tokyo. And by this time, he was already um, on the blacklist in the Intelligence Bureau files. Um, on the left, I found very interesting. Like I also love digging around in the National Archives. All the INA files are there. So I found a rogues gallery that they have of Indian suspects living in J Japan. Um, and Anand Mohan Sai's photo was right there, very prominent. Um, he wrote a lot, he published a lot. This is a book, a play actually he wrote called In India, which again was not permitted to enter India, um, saying it was very subversive, the content um, was censored. Um, and then throughout this time, there was a connection with Netaji. Um, so because um, Sati was in the same house as Netaji, in, in Siyar Das's house, um, they had this almost sibling relationship. So they were sending letters back and forth, and the letters were actually being um, sent via steamships. And this, on the top right, if you can see, it's very thin rice paper. I actually saw this in Asha San's uh, sister's house. Very thin paper, and it's got um, Anand Mohan Sahai's uh, initials on the side written. So they used to uh, stitch this in blankets and send it on steamships, and it used to be given by cabin boys to Netaji in, in Calcutta. Um, but at some point, this ruse was, uh, the, the British intelligence figured it out, and they had to stop doing it. So then Sati and Anand, they came up with this grand ruse of pretending that they had split up. They said that this marriage is not working. Sati is returning to India with two kids, Asha, Anand, Monsa, and the elder sister, uh, the, the other sister, Tulu, would stay in Japan. And um, this was actually just done so that Sati could go to Calcutta to tell Netaji that East Asia is ready for a leader like you. Um, so she did manage to give this message to Netaji through his niece, Bella, Bella Mitra. Um, and then throughout once, Netaji escaped um, and made his way to Kabul towards Germany. Um, Anand Mohan Sahai was in touch with the German embassy as well. Um, there's lots of letters back and forth as well here. There is documentation here. Um, and he was actually even questioned by the Japanese Secret Service, the Kempitai, for this. But they did not, even though they were sort of allied, they did not appreciate this level of communication between Nazi Germany and um, Anand Mohan Sahai. On the bottom right, again, we've got a letter from uh, Rabindranath Tagore to Sati. When Sati is asking, um, can I stay with you in Shanti Niketan? Can, can I get accommodation? So he's written, I'm so glad you have returned. Come here with your daughter, and after talking to the authorities, you may decide. There is accommodation for girls, girls over here. There will be no inconvenience. I am busy with the Spring Festival. So he was a busy man. Then in June 1943 is when um, Netaji makes his hazardous submarine journey from um, Germany across the tip of Africa and into Japan. Um, they meet in Imperial Hotel. So this is a photograph that was taken um, at Imperial Hotel in 1943. In the front you can see next to Netaji, um, Sati is sitting there. And to Netaji's left is General Posley, then Anand Mohan Sahai. Asha San is in the third row with her sister Tulu. And right at the back, you can also see Abid Hassan, who was with Netaji on the submarine. Um, and in the book, Asha San makes fun of his little beard. So you can even see his little beard. And again, I just love when stories come alive. So this is a video I found off Imperial Hotel in 1935. So you can just imagine um, Netaji walked in here. 
the entire family was there to greet him. All the Indians in, in Tokyo were there to greet him. And this is exactly where the photograph was taken. You can see the same facade in the brickwork. So Asha son with Netaji and her mother um, Sati. Um, so then this diary is sort of begins at this point here. And um, Asha son, like I said, published it in 1973 in a serialized form in Tharmyog magazine. And I think I just want to point out that this is not just a historical document. Because of the fact that it was written in Japanese, because of her Japanese sensibilities, the focus on nature, the focus on seasons, it's a very interesting document. It's a very interesting piece of literature. It's very artistically written. And I think I've tried to retain that in the English. Um, so it's, it, it's, a, it's the story of a young girl, actually, and it comes across in that voice. Between 1943 and 1945, um, Asha-san was in, in Tokyo. Um, she was studying at Shouakaojo College. Um, her family was also there. And you get to see life during the war in Japan. Um, she, she used to say that she used to watch these to watch um, gunfights between the Mitsubishi Zeros and the Hellcats, all the dog fights that used to happen in the sky. That was their form of entertainment. Bombs used to fall, they used to rush into trenches. If they had to give exams, they would take the exam papers and write in the trenches. Um, here we can see um, this photograph of her younger two siblings, that's Baby and Ashok. So they were actually sent off to the hills with all the young kids. They were evacuated from the cities, um, but Asha-san and her other sister remained with their mother in Tokyo. And then towards the end of the war, so 1945, early 1945 is when the bombing became very, very bad. Um, B-29 bombers would approach one after the other, and right after she left Tokyo in uh, March 1945 is when the firebombing of uh, Tokyo happened. And that's when they say 100,000 people died just with these B-29 bombers. And the same bombs that would eventually, uh, same planes that would eventually drop um, the, the nuclear bombs. So then in October 21st, 1943, is the day when Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose took charge and uh, the Yazad Hind government was formed. Um, the Yazad Hind forge came under that. Um, the Indian independence leagues across Asia all came under this. Um, and we can see Anand Mohan Sai is, stand, is sitting right at the back. Um, he, uh, he was a minister in the cabinet of Netaji. And this, uh, this photograph is, I found it in the archive. It's a very unusual perspective. I haven't seen it before. Um, it's uh, from Cathay Cinema in Singapore. And Asha San writes in the diary that she was sitting in Tokyo and she could hear the, the, the narrator saying that this is happening in Cathay Cinema. Um, they were just hooked onto the radio saying that finally India has a provisional government, a free government. Um, while she was in Tokyo, a lot um, of dignitaries would visit. So in, in, in November 1943, um, again, this Pan-Asian conference was held called the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. Um, on the right, you can see Netaji, and above him is Anand Mohan Sai. Right at the center is General Tojo, then we have Ba Mao uh, from Burma, we have the representatives from Manchuria, China, Thailand, Philippines. Again, this was a union formed to oppose Western imperialism. And Asha San and her mother were there. They, they were witnessing all of this and they write about it in the diary. So this is, this is a small newspaper clipping that came out. So you can see her mother and um, Asha San and Raj Bihari Bose's wife, Majiko Bose, is also there. So throughout the diary, we can see all these events happening, but from a distance, from what she reads in the newspapers, what she hears, from letters that come back and forth. Um, in December 1943, um, Japan handed over the Andaman Islands to the provisional government of um, India. And um, Anand Mohan Sai was there at cellular jail when this happened, and he writes about it in all these letters. So that's, it's fascinating going through all the letters, going through the archives and finding all these snippets of information. Um, July 1944, the Tokyo boys arrived in, in Tokyo. And these were young boys, 17 years old, 18 years old, recruited from Burma, Malaysia, trained to be officers of the Azad Hind Forge. 
um, and they were being trained at the Tokyo Imperial Japanese Army, at the Imperial Japanese Air Force, um, and they would often visit home. So we get stories from Asha San's diary about how they came visiting and they were asking questions. And um, I'm mentioning this because there are just so many stories that have not been unearthed. And um, there's one um, young, at that point, young man wearing spectacles on the second from the right, bottom row. So his grandson got in touch with me um, recently saying that, oh, my father was a Tokyo boy. I'm looking for more information. So I think there are just so many stories buried in the archives, buried in personal family histories that we need to take out. And again, these boys, a very fascinating story about how they even reached Japan. The, the ship they were traveling on got torpedoed. They had to s swim to safety. Um, they were there when the bombs fell. They were rendered homeless. And actually, they ended up living with the Sahai family in Tokyo when they had no place to go. Um, in February 1945 is when Asha-san finally donned her uniform and made her way to the Rani of Chasi Regiment. So she had a very emotional farewell at her college, Shovakojo College. Um, on the left, we can see a photograph with her, her schoolmates. Um, so on the, in the center, it's her, she's posing with her seniors from her college. And again, a very incredible story was um, there was no interaction between her college and her um, post the war. I think they had shared addresses, but letters got lost, misplaced. Um, then, um, in I think about in the year 2000 or so, she was volunteering in a, in a Japanese Buddhist shrine in Bodh Gaya. And somebody from a college heard that there's this Indian woman who speaks very good Japanese in Bodh Gaya. They tracked her down. They connected all the dots and they invited her back to Japan in 2009. So in the photo on the right, you can see how she returned to college and she was the chief guest at the 90th uh, convocation of um, Showa Koja College. So, so the journey she took to even reach the Rani of Chasi Regiment camp was an incredible journey. And for me, again, this book is as much about the journey as the destination. Um, she made her way by train down to Kobe, her hometown, saw it completely destroyed, went to Taiwan, um, was stuck there for a while, met Kamakazi pilots there. Um, very, very emotional, so we talk about that in a bit later. Um, was in a bomber which was being targeted by fighter planes, narrowly escaped, um, eventually, eventually reached Thailand and she joined the Rani of Chasi Regiment camp in, uh, in 1945 in Bangkok. Um, so the Kamikaze pilots, again, very, very emotional story here. Um, they were there in, in Taiwan, in Taichu, when uh, Masha San was there. And they had, a entire, they had a farewell ceremony, which Asha San was a part of. And in this ceremony, she had to serve them some um, kind of sake. And in return, she got this. In the center, you can see this Japanese letters was written on a tenagui, which is a small towel, and it was gifted to her. And it was actually given by Captain Michio Kusaba on the top left. Um, that photograph is not very clear, so I've put some photographs um, below. And um, again, in 2009, um, Captain Michio's brother was located. And it was very emotional for him to meet someone who had met his brother on the last day he was alive. Uh, and she handed back the Tenugui. She handed back everything that was given to her, to his family. And um, the next day, obviously, this was during the Battle of Okinawa. And lots of kamikaze pilots um, attained martyrdom that day. In, in 1945 is when she joins the Rani of Jhansi Regiment training camp in Bangkok. And there were several camps across um, Singapore, Burma, and Bangkok. And um, there were about 500 to 1,000 Ranis. They were called Ranis who eventually joined the Rani of Jhansi Regiment. Um, there's no actual documentation on them. Most of the INA records on them have been destroyed. So everything that we have is more through oral histories. Um, So, so Captain uh, Lakshmi, Lakshmi Segal was obviously the person who started the regiment. Um, their paths did not overlap. Um, Lakshmi Segal was sent to Burma at that point when she joined uh, Bangkok, Asha San joined Bangkok. And um, the training was, was quite rigorous. It was, um, train, it was inf an infantry regiment trained for combat. Um, so in the mornings they would get up, they would do PT, they would do parades, marching. Mid-morning, they would uh, have weapons training, so it would include rifles, bayonets, 
like machine guns, submachine guns, anti-aircraft guns. Um, they would also be taught how to drive trucks, bikes, guerrilla warfare. So in the book, they, they do talk about an incident of guerrilla warfare. And um, this is a very interesting photograph, so I don't have a better resolution of it, but in the center is Anand Mohan Sahai, and he's crossed over into India in 1944. This is during the Battle of Imphal time, right before it. And um, he was one of, uh, we all know that once the battle happened, um, there were the, 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 the entire INA retreated. Um, there was one platoon of the Rani Chasi regiment that went up with, um, with the INA soldiers, but this was before Asha San joined. So she didn't actually end up going to Burma. She went marching towards Burma in 1945, but they had to retreat. Um, again, by the time she joined, there was heavy aerial bombardment happening by the Britishers. And um, the end came very soon for her, actually. Um, in August 1945, she was also sick. Um, the atom bombs <laughs> fell on Japan. Netaji died in, in August, in August um, 1945. And very soon after, they were kept in camp prison, um, the Anglo-American forces, as she called them. Um, took away their guns, took away their rifles, and she was eventually sent to live with a family in, in Thailand. Her father at this time was um, in Saigon. He was um, trying to go up and, according to Netaji's instructions, make contact with the Russians, um, but he couldn't make it that far. So um, she was um, kept in Bangkok, and um, I found, again, very interesting files in the National Archives and the INA files with the British uh, Home Department asking what should we do with Asha Sahai of the Rani Jhansi Regiment? Should she be allowed back to India? Will she cause ferment if she returns? She is the daughter of Anand Mohan Sahai, what should we do? Um, and, and at the center here is a very interesting letter by um, Habibu Rahman, who was on Netaji's flight when it crashed. And um, interestingly, he is the one who brought Netaji's ashes to Tokyo, and the ashes were kept in the Sahai house so this is a letter that he wrote, a note he wrote, stating Netaji's last words. So let me just read it here. Uh, Convey to my countrymen that I have fought up to the last for India's independence. Continue the struggle, O countrymen. Before long, India shall be free. Long live free India, Azad Hind. So according to him, these were Netaji's last words. And um, the urn was kept in Netaji's, uh, in, in the Sahaya house for about a week before it was sent to Renkuji Temple. And Sati Sahai, Tulu, the rest of the family was there when the procession went to Renkuji Temple to drop off the ashes. Um, her father was then arrested in um, early, uh, end 1945. So he was sent to prison in Singapore. And um, he did have a death sentence on him, like members of the INA. Um, and here you can see a letter that he's written to Asha. Jai Hind, having failed to receive any news from you in spite of um, sending nearly half, not very clear, half a dozen letters, I have sent a reply paid telegram to you three days ago. I do not know if you will receive the telegram and I will receive a reply to that within the next few days. So you can just see the, the sort of, the atmosphere of nobody actually knew where the other person was Asha San believed that the bomb, actually when it fell, had fallen on Tokyo. She wow. believed her family was no more. Um, so there was, there was just, with a, that sense of immediacy is what comes across in the diary as well, that when you're living the war, it's, you don't know what's happening around you. You don't know if your family members are safe or not. You don't know where they are. Um, and the photograph on the right is actually when her family returns from Tokyo. This is much later in July, 1947. Um, and so, some people have asked me, and even in the diary, you get this sense that Asha San feels that she hasn't contributed anything to the war. She feels like the war ended before I could do anything, before I could go marching to Burma. So you get this sense that she feels inadequate. But honestly, when you actually look at this, um, the impact of the INA was felt much afterwards. It's when the INA trials happened in the Red Fort, which was like very badly um, judged by the British to do it in the Red Fort, to do it in Delhi, to make heroes out of um, Shanawas Khan, Dhillon, Segal. Um, so her, her 
impact was actually felt when she returned to India. So she returned to India in um, 1946, April. And she, her father, and her uncle, Satyadev Sahai, they went touring across the country. They, um, held, they were there at demonstrations, at processions, and this message of what the INA did finally reached the people of India. They went to villages, they were um, lauded everywhere they went. And even this, at this time, she didn't feel like she should be up there on stage. But I think this is what the crucial point is, that the message of the INA said, told the people of India, yes, that it's okay to struggle, that there is a struggle happening for India, beyond India's borders. And people who are part of the British Indian Army have become part of the Azad Hind Forge. So this message of how many sacrifices have been made spread across India, and I believe that it led to one of the one of the main reasons it led to um, the freedom of India. Um, the, the, the RIN mutinies, for example. It was through all these messages that came out. Um, so Dr. Rajendra Prasad is actually my maternal great-grandfather as well, great-great-grandfather, and behind him is my grandmother on the, on the left side. And she told me that in 1946, Asha San came to Satakat Ashram in Patna, and uh, she saw this young girl wearing a uniform, and what an image it was, it's something that did not leave her. To see a woman in uniform, to see someone so young fighting for the country, sacrificing everything for a country, and it's, it's something that stuck on with her. So after she, after India won independence, um, none of, nobody in the family was actually very happy the day um, India won independence because they were very, very distraught with the idea of the partition. Um, but two years later, she got married, and she got married to a relatively conservative family in Bihar. She had children, um, and this sort of, this legacy of the INA of what all she did sort of faded. Nobody spoke about it. It was just absolute silence. Um, until she published the, the diary entries in 1973. But again, there was nothing, like nobody, nobody in the government came and lauded her or anything. But in the last 10, 15 years is when she sort of got some recognition. Um, but I think, for me, the, the biggest takeaway is um, the stories that are in this book. The stories that will carry on with for our children. So on the right is Asha San with my son. Um, she's teaching him how to shoot a gun. Um, <laughs> so, so for me, it's, it's amazing to be in the same room with her. It feels that you're in the room with someone who's lived through one of the most momentous occasions in India. Um, and it makes you realize that India is not that older country. There's so much hope for India. There's, there's so many stories that we need to find, to develop, to research to dig out of the archives. I think it's upon all of us to make sure that these stories do not get lost. Thank you. Subscribe to Sarmaya and be a part of the stories and conversations around art, history, and culture.